Hello and welcome to the 59th New York Film Festival presented by Film at Lincoln Center. I'm Eileen Nash, one of the programmers of the current section of the festival. And I'm very pleased to be in conversation with P.L. Kapadia, um, whose feature film, A Night of Knowing Nothing, is presented in the current section. So welcome, P.L. Thank you very much. I'm really, really happy to be part of uh, the festival. Um, and I wish I could have been there in person, but it's, yeah. it's nice all the same. <laughs> yes, we wish you could have been here with us too, but I'm very glad um, we're gonna have a chance to speak now. Um, so firstly, thank you so much for this incredibly um, rich and um, beautiful work. Um, I thought we might begin by speaking about the textual elements, which are so um, powerful and I think so important in terms of how you um, frame the story of student activism, but within, but it's told through um, very specific uh, lens of this um, kind of impossible love story. Um, so I wondered if you could talk about um, your, yeah, your process of writing and how you kind of came to create the structure. Yeah, so this film, we've been making, we, when I say we, uh, my partner, Ron Obeer, who's the cinematographer, editor of the mm -hmm. film, and we were working very closely uh, together on the film. And when we started shooting, it was when we were still in film school around late 2016, 17. Oh, wow. And it wasn't a film that we knew what we were going to do. It was just this urgency to shoot. And mm -hmm. we started shooting our friends. It was interviews, long extended interviews, sometimes random rambling, you know, with people who are our really close friends. And uh, with a lot of my work, I was interested in these ideas of impossible love and the difficulties of falling in love in India because of all the social constraints that are there, which are related to caste and religion and all these things. So these were some of the questions that I was asking at that time as well, just as an extension of what I was interested in. And so we had all these hours of interviews, but over the years, we started shooting different things and a lot started changing around us. Friends gave us a lot of footage and the film sort of moved away from its original point mm. uh, of, of where we had basically started thinking about it and a completely new film began to form. But we wanted to keep some of those elements of what you know, those interviews and things that we had spoken in the beginning. And that was so much a part of what kind of drove us and, you know, how we were thinking about things. And it's very difficult to talk about young people in India if you don't talk about love. And that's true everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. and the film is also about, about the youth and, you know, being a university student. So we felt that this, this kind of uh, fictional narrative of discovering love letters that are never sent and found somewhere would be an interesting way to do it. Mm -hmm. So we created two characters. One is the, is, is, the, is the girl who's written the letters and the other is the narrator who just comes in the form of texts. Mm -hmm. And I started working, uh, I have a co-writer, Himantru Prajapati, who was also my classmate from film school. So we knew each other very well. The film school is for five years. So we're almost very, in like you know it becomes like a family yeah so <laughs> so we worked really closely in trying to you know think about this character and writing a lot of letters uh so we would uh, write many letters didn't make it to the film for example mm -hmm. and a lot of the letters were written looking at the material because at the end of the day it became a found footage film you know even mm -hmm. though we had shot a lot of stuff it was so long ago that we, the association with the footage had completely changed over time because we mm -hmm. had changed over time. So uh, it, we began to approach it that, okay, we have all this material, some is archival, some is things that we've shot, some is from friends. So how do we write these letters so that we can kind of, you know, form the links uh, to it? And sometimes the letters are completely not connected to the image. And sometimes, I mean, that's how we wanted to keep it so that it creates a kind of a third idea but the juxtaposition is as important as the text and the image. So the mm. three things sort of work together, you know, um, so it doesn't all, doesn't remain like an illustration of what's happening on screen. Mm -hmm. That was something that we were really consciously thinking about. 
um, yeah, and the, and and the sense that there is a third person who's also the filmmaker, kind of you know, uh, uh, giving some information about um, what's going on in the film. So that mm. was the other uh, layer that we wanted to have. Yeah, right. But all this came from the editing process, like editing and writing were happening together. So it right. was very very organic and like seeing this, seeing a kind of body form from a lot of mass. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's a fun process. Yeah, um, yeah, and curious about kind of the other side of that, which of course is the visual material, which I also find, you know, you really weave all of these various types of media together so beautifully. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, the, the footage that you shot, but also some archival footage, some photography, I love the presence of all of these little drawings and doodles that we see is kind of superimposed and coming in and out. Um, but also even the like vertical um, mobile phone footage. And you have this way of really creating this cohesive aesthetic and bringing them all together into this kind of, you know, very um, aesthetically kind of uh, like, um, I don't know, textually, they, they somehow feel like of the same world, which I think is um, really astounding that you're able to do that with all of these different forms. Um, and I think in, in some ways, it makes the footage have this almost timeless feeling where you can't quite place where it's from. Mm. You know, obviously, the verticality of the mobile phone footage is quite specific, but um, it almost has there's this sense, this continuity of political struggle and eras where, you know, it feels like it's, it's always been happening and it's all kind of part of the same time, yeah. which I think um, is really beautiful, but love to hear about how you approach that. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that this thing of a black and white image and this grainy quality was somewhere, I think, where we started off shooting and it was kind of evoking, uh, you know, in film school, we we would we had a lot of films from the Soviet, erstwhile Soviet Union, and we would be watching those a lot. So it was kind of in our um, aesthetic memory, let's say. Yeah. So <laughs> we wanted to have that sense as well. And then slowly we realized that, you know, there's so much different kinds of footage. And that I think is also fine that, you know, in, in today's uh, image making is, comes from so many different kinds of formats that mm -hmm. you can, so the film has eight mm footage and it goes to like uh, mobile phone footage uh, and CCTV footage. So it's yeah. those things were all found. And I think that it's great that we have the possibility to have all these different types of image making and um, I, they're all equally good. So, you know, I wanted, we want, we, 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 we were first forced to put them into the film because we really wanted those images, but we realized mm -hmm. that they completely work well together and speak to one and each other to, to, as like you said, the time, times that they were in the, they, they speak to one another. But also I think that the, the kind of texture of the film and the black and white nature was somewhere we were thinking about this idea of nostalgia, uh, to create a sense of nostalgia and nostalgia mm -hmm. usually has to do with something good uh, you know a fond fondness for something mm -hmm. but it wasn't necessarily uh, a nostalgia for the past uh, because i don't think the past was was something that we need to aspire for the past was not better which is why we've gotten here in the first place mm -hmm. but it was a kind of a nostalgia for you know this thing of being young and idealistic and uh, of that feeling, I think, that yeah. we that we all went through at some part of our life. And I think that's what we wanted to evoke uh, to create nostalgia, but maybe for contemporary times. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that brings me really nicely into my next question, which is around, you know, creating this work around the context of a film school, which is, you know, I think the film school that you attended, and as you said, where, you know, a lot of the, the people you work with are people that you met at this time. Yes. And, um, 
yeah, I guess I was thinking a lot about kind of the the inextric inextricable relationship between cinematic history and revolutionary history and the place that um, academia and film school have in in that. So I wondered if this was something you were also thinking about throughout. Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, I think film is a very small part of revolutionary history, but it is a small part of course. there. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, when when I was thinking, I was, I was thinking about this question, and uh, what came to mind was that when we first studied, uh, let's say, revolutionary film, it was an editing class, you know, in mm -hmm. our film school editing class, because we had yeah. to study montage. So then you have to study Eisenstein, and you have to right. study, you know, the the Eisensteinian montage and the five different things. So this is how we first started looking at like so-called, and it's completely propaganda films. So, you know, watching this kind of political and cinema. And uh, so this is how we were introduced to it through film school. So yeah. a lot of, you know, my understanding of political cinema comes from very basic fundamental formalistic things like how to edit, how to montage. And then, you know, what, what, what is that doing politically? What, what right. are the filmmakers doing with it? And we would also study like Griffith because you know you need to study Griffith if you are you know studying editing because as much as the problems you have with Griffith politically, what he was doing with editing is something that is still relevant to every big Hollywood film even today. So mm -hmm. you know the the great chase sequences and the intercutting and compact compression of time and expansion, yeah. all these things. Uh, but at the end of the day, he's making a completely political film for his own propaganda and his own agenda and, you know, promoting the Klan, which is, you know, and I was recently watching this uh, film of Adam Curtis. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. seen, but uh, he was talking about how a lot of the iconography of the Klan comes from the Griffith film. And wow. this completely, you know, <laughs> makes you think what cinema has been, you know, been able to do. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, coming back to the to, to your question, um, yeah, like I said, that the film school itself, uh, you know, India when 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 we when we got independence, there was a lot of uh, there was a sort of a soft alliance with the Soviet Union. So a lot of our institutes were built on certain Soviet uh, institute ideas, including our mm -hmm. film school, which was in the sixties. Mm -hmm. So they we would get a lot of films from. Uh, the USSR, like reels, actual films, when we had the National Film Archive and we were able to watch these films on a daily basis. So, you know, we would be watching Eisenstein, Podovkin, but also, uh, you know, the Czech New Wave, films of Zabo, uh, Istvan Zabo, and or the French New Wave. So, you know, these things became, these are very everyday part of our film school life. So, which is, I mean, I, I, I really cherish this experience and that's also what the film is about. This, you know, a deep love and thankfulness for this experience that we had. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, since the film is also about the space of the film school, a lot of these elements also find themselves in the film uh, and like quotes. <laughs> and it, it, for example, even, you know, one of our very early teachers of the film school in the 60s was a very important director to me and to Indian cinema. Uh, his mm. name is Ritwik Ghatak. And mm. uh, his films are absolutely revolutionary. But and, and the form that he chooses to use completely complements his ideas, his political ideas. So mm. a lot of these things, uh, I think, made a lot of impression on all of us while we were there. And yeah, I think, like you said, they are very intertwined and the form of things and, and, and what the filmmakers politics is at that time can't really be separated. And it can sometimes be very problematic and <laughs> sometimes not. Yeah, of course. And yeah, it's reminding me of a conversation I had with my students just last week around um, Godard's text in which he asks, um, how do we, you know, distinguishes between making political films and um, making films politically and what that looks like. And that's something I was thinking about in rewatching your film is um, the choices you make. Yeah, exactly as you're saying through the form and how the politics are expressed, not 
only through the content, but in, in how you're representing people in the choices you make to not show people and, and what those things mean. So I wondered if you could, yeah, talk about some of those choices you're thinking through. Yeah, I mean, firstly, thank you for introducing me to the text because I hadn't read it before and I thought it was quite marvelous. So yeah. I was delighted <laughs> to, to discover it. Um, and um, the thing, the way I think about this is that for me, all cinema is political, is, is, is a political point of view and is a political position. And the filmmaker's political position is very, very clear in whatever the film may be. Even if the filmmaker mm -hmm. says, I am apolitical, which is a statement that really annoys me because it's not possible mm -hmm. to be. That in itself is the politics of the film and it very clearly yeah. shows. And uh, the ideology and politics are very much part of the form um, in the film. Even if you watch a classic Hollywood film, it's, it's going to be quite evident of where the filmmaker places their political position. Yeah. So I, I yeah, that's what, so I, I don't think that a film necessarily is like, okay, this is a political film or this is not a political film. But for me, everything is approached through politics and, and, and has a political point of view. So yeah, I, I think they're inseparable. <laughs> in a way, the form of the film and the politics. And that's the scary part sometimes I feel like, as a filmmaker, you can't, full, you can't actually hide what your political view is because it comes out, cinema has, a, has, has, the, has the ability to very clearly show what, where, where you stand. Yeah, and I think these choices are very um, evident in your work. I was, um... Also listened to another interview you did where you, you spoke about how in the early parts of um, making this film, as you said earlier, you were doing a lot of interviews and talking to a lot of people, but that you chose not to show, you know, kind of people directly speaking or, you know, these choices to um, have the footage present of, of some of these um, protests and things, but then to have you're expressing some of the ideas rather through text or through kind of like, you know, parsing some of these moments, um, you know, through different kind of visual approaches you're taking. So I just wondered if maybe you could speak a little specifically about some of, some of these decisions around representation or some of your thinking around how you wanted to convey these messages. I think what happened is that the amount of, firstly, the, the, these were the times that we were living in. So even though this is not a film like necessarily about me, but it's, mm. it has a bit of all of us uh, who experienced some of this in it, my friends, um, my colleagues. Uh, so it becomes very difficult when you've been seen very closely uh, certain things that have affected you to be completely able to um, deal with it in cinema. It, it becomes mm -hmm. a very cathartic process. And I think the film was also a sort of catharsis for all of us who are working on it. Um, and I fe felt that the, the, the form that was being used, uh, because the time of the film is very long. The, the film is actually okay. five years and it's, right. you can't, and, 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 and the issues are so complicated and so nuanced that each of them would take one or one hour to like you just to just to start It'd be a mini it. series yeah it would it could definitely be so i knew that you know we had very very complex issues um, that would be a film that would that would become maybe four or five hours so how do we kind of get a sense of what we want to talk about and some of the questions that we ourselves are trying to address uh, you know and uh, to create a sense of what we felt emotionally mm, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and to bring that out rather than having, um, you know, specifics. Uh, that was something that's important, that was important to me. Then not to illustrate what happened uh, exactly that on this day, this, you know, to have that, right. you know, the chronology of things is not, was not as important as the emotion of things. And that's right. really how we approached the film, just through yeah. a very uh, a feeling of emotion um, that we went through. 
Mm. So, yeah, I think that was the kind of point that was important. Yeah, and that's so felt, I think, in this work. And um, I think one of the really beautiful aspects of the craft of this film is the sound design, which I'd love to hear you speak about. Um, particularly what struck me, and I really couldn't place where I'd seen someone use uh, silence in such a powerful way, um, where these moments where, you know, we're clearly in these protest moments, but you've cut the sound and the images are, you know, speak so much more loudly than um, without the sound. And um, I thought that that was a particular kind of tactic that you used that was so um, powerful and also, you know, somehow emotional, I think. Um, so, yeah, and also just throughout the film, the, the sound work was really uh, quite striking. I'd love to hear more about how you put that together. The, the thing, I've always tried to use sound uh, in all my other work as well. As sound has been a, a, a very important part of how I approach films. And even how I approach the image is usually through sound. So mm -hmm. it, I work in this... <laughs> Uh, a convoluted way but uh, it's uh, I so for this film as well I was very interested in using sound again not in a way that's illustrative but uh, evokes an internal feeling mm -hmm. but not using music uh, but to use silences and tones mm -hmm. uh, like music but uh, in a way that that, that is felt um, you know, so this was something that I was keen to continue from my previous work as well, that sound mm -hmm. um, is something that, you know, sound has this quality, like it's, the image is something that is, that is in front of you, it's in the screen, you are, you are distanced from it, but sound is actually waves, it's coming at you, you yeah. are experiencing it, so mm -hmm. it's actually like a physical feeling, mm -hmm. and since the film was also something that, uh, that, that was from a very emotional space, uh, the sound design became very important to create that sense and that feeling. Uh, and I think that silences and the loudness of things, uh, you know, sometimes what happens is that when, when you've had a lot of sound and then suddenly you have a silence, it works like a highlight. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like your attention suddenly goes to those things that you know the image at that point or to the silence at that point and it works in uh, in that way and I think of it as painting kind of with mm -hmm. sound uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit uh, but uh, you know like there's when you, when you study painting you say okay the, the 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 painter is highlighting with with white and the darkness uh, and and the white point is this is is how your eye is supposed to move over the painting so right. I was trying to think about how sound could also, you know, work in this way that it leads you to ma maneuver yourself through the film. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that was kind of the approach to sound. Um, yeah, I think it, it works beautifully. Um, just one last question. I was just curious to hear um, if you're working on something new and if there's something you could tell us about, about a new upcoming work. I'm working, I've been working on a fiction project for some time now, mm. uh, and it's still in financing at the moment, which takes a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it's also about impossible love. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of an extension of, of from my shorts to this film, uh, to the next one as well. And I'm going to also try to use a lot of uh, mixed material in that as well. So. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 still some time away, and uh, hopefully, I'm going to be able to shoot next year if all goes well. Great, looking forward to that. Well, thank you so much for uh, your film and for sharing your process with us. Thank you for having me.